So last year, after I was completing my interview with John Casey about journaling, we talked a little bit further after the recording, and he told me about focusing. His mom is actually also a practitioner. And um, focusing actually is more than merely concentrating on a single point. It's a, it's a different practice. And it's not the conventional concept of focusing. And I became curious about this and what he told me about it. And I decided to research. And ultimately, I was led to you, Beth. And um, I'm here today to pick um, your brain on the topic of focusing. It's actually a technique for tapping into the bodily knowing. It's a technique for grounding ourselves and to explore and experience our whole selves and what needs to find growth and healing. And I think that it's, it's a very interesting concept uh, to me. So um, Beth, you are a certified focused oriented therapist, a practitioner and a teacher of focusing for many years. Um, you've also been a psychotherapist for over 19 years, I believe, um, and a joint professor in sociology of death and grief at William Patterson's University in New Jersey. I hope I, I set those things right. I've just been scrolling around and, and doing my research on you. Um, thanks so much, Beth, for being here with me today to talk about focusing. I'm, I'm very curious. You're welcome. And I, I'm looking forward to being here and answering any questions you might have. Sure, sure. Um, one of the powers of focusing is a very grassroots kind of spreading it because we believe in it so much. Um, yeah. The people who begin to learn about it, uh, practice it, and then want to learn more and spread it further. So share it with others. I'm, I'm eager to share. Yeah, really great. Before we dive into the practice of focusing and why it's beneficial, I'd love to start um, with a personal question and hear from you how that this become a part of your tool belt, a tool belt, both personally and also professionally. Could you tell me more about this? Absolutely. Um, it was uh, bringing a one of my children to a therapist who I knew did EMDR, um, yeah. eye movement desensitization reprocessing. If you're familiar with that process, and she also happens to be Eleanor Busher, John's mother. Okay, yeah. And um, she introduced me, she's a long-term colleague uh, and introduced me to focusing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I immediately felt this bodily knowing that we describe yeah. um, as she was working with my son. And I wanted to learn it personally and professionally. Mm -hmm which ultimately helped me get through probably the most difficult 10 years of my life so far. Wow, yeah. Yeah, when, when, I, when I've been researching it, I also realized, I mean, I wasn't familiar with the concept as such, but I do recognize the process and I think that I've been doing it myself very much already over, over quite some time. Um, if I would have to ask you, Beth, for a simple definition of focusing for someone who doesn't know anything about it, what would you say? Um, it is simple and yet profound. Mm -hmm. It is a natural organic process that we do already know how to connect with. Mm -hmm what Eugene Genlin termed this bodily felt sense. Yeah. Um, and at, at, at some point in time, um, from messages, we get cut off from connecting to that bodily felt knowing. So it's almost like we're relearning something mm -hmm. we already know how to do. We already know this inner experience. And, and why do we get disconnected? Or at least why do some people get disconnected? Perhaps some people might be able to, to keep this connection at least to some extent, but what causes us to, to get disconnected from this ability? Uh, many things, uh, people in our lives, mm -hmm. the um, repetition of a certain kind of parenting, grandparenting, teachers, um, maybe telling ourselves that that bodily 
sense of movement in our belly is not normal mm -hmm. or not right uh, and ignore it. Mm -hmm. um, here in the United States, we have a pretty preconceived medical model, which says, if you feel something in there, take something yeah. <laughs> and ingest it, as opposed to come inside, ingest the feeling tone of it and listen to it. Yeah. And so we kind of need to back up or relearn or um, be supported that it's okay to to notice these inner felt experiences mm -hmm. and to express them and have someone there to listen and respond to say oh you're noticing you're noticing how there's that inside there listen to it let me know more about it yeah because that's basically um, put really simple, the practice, right? Is to be curious, non-judgmental about whatever it is that you're feeling inside, mostly actually in the abdominal region, if I've understood correctly, or that's typically a place where things show up. Um, so that's typically the, the like the holding container mm. where things are stored more long-term. Yeah. Um, we do access bodily felt senses throughout our body, but sometimes it's this avenue into felt sensing further, deeper, making a deeper contact to the felt sense that ultimately this maybe cut off that we have from the felt sense that mm -hmm. we're coming closer to it. You might start by noticing a tightness tension in the neck and if we stay with it, it 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 has a way of opening a door to say okay you're i'm developing trust that you're going to stay here yeah. and i'm going to open yeah. a door and, and i'm going to come deeper and then we might notice something in our chest and then and then we stay with it and it deepens so there's this felt shift response that the body says okay i'm trusting you again yeah trusting you're going to stay with me here. Yeah. And this is beyond the typical emotions we feel stir up, right? Like fear or anger or, or other kinds of things. It's beyond that. Yes. Yeah. So fear is, or any emotion is yeah. an aspect of connecting, making contact to a felt sense. Yeah. But when we ask someone, we might say, what's the emotional quality of that? Because uh -huh. what's super important is we want to come in the present moment yes. with yes. our full self in presence, yeah. to come toward the emotional quality that's present right now. Yeah. And, and that helps us to really kind of just be with a felt sense in its actual um, amount or form. Mm -hmm. When we focus on the emotion, sometimes people begin to feel this flooding of an emotion. Overwhelmed, yeah. Because they connect with all the past experiences yes. of the time they felt fear, yeah. not just the quality of the fear as they're experiencing it in this moment. Yeah. That's a very interesting point. I, I've also researched uh, how to be present, for instance. Um, I've researched the topic of honesty. And in both those um, conversations that I've had and, and also the research, what really came up is, and, and again, also like now, the non-judgmental part is to allow whatever there, uh, whatever is there to be there. And indeed, like you say, with the tension in the shoulder, when you just accept that it's there and you don't have a judgment about it, it kind of dissolves and it makes space for you to kind of relax or let go of tension and go deeper. And I, I, for, for me, this is a very interesting part. I think that's actually some of, that's why I'm interested that we're having this conversation because one of the big red lines, maybe I'm biased towards it, but one of the big red lines that I've been seeing through the topics that I've researched and even seemingly disconnecting topics also for instance connection the topic of connection and letting go of perfection but the, the 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 big red line is indeed this letting go of the tension that we hold and also a part of about, about being vulnerable and 
allowing to show whatever is there. And I, I think this is really interesting. And what Eugene Gendlin said about this, um, he says that the body is much more than this physiological machine. There is, there is much more knowing there. Can, can you say more about this knowing part or how, do you, do you understand where I'm pointing towards? Yeah, so there's um, what we call uh, kind of the inner experience and how we in presence are making a connection, developing this sense of trust to that inner experience, but we're also already connected to say a person or people. And there's a felt shared resonant space between mm -hmm. us. Yes. And then there's um, like a pathway where we can sense a, a felt shared resonance of, are we on the same wavelength? Are we mm -hmm. on the same sensing? Um, are, are we, or is there a point at which there's a little disconnect? And yes. that's where you yes. might clarify a question for me, or you may ask, uh, am I getting where you're pointing toward? Um, so I sense, no, I'm not really sure, Julius, I've just met you, mm -hmm. but there's something about what else is out there beyond the inner experience. Mm -hmm. And it's this shared resonance with people, with the environment, yeah. right? So you may, um, go out into the woods and you may get into grounded presence and be able to connect more safely with an inner experience because there's not as many disruptions as if mm -hmm. you were on the street of a very busy city and you have people around you, you have, you have yeah. rushing happening, you have airplanes flying overhead, you have um, cars zipping by, right? So the more there is in the environment, the, the more difficult it becomes to have like a clear line of shared resonance where mm -hmm. I might be able to connect deeper with my own bodily felt sense of that resonance, right? Yeah. So my thousands of life experiences are very different from your thousands of lived experiences, but mm -hmm. somewhere in there, there, there's some human experience where we have a connection, some shared resonance of something. And if we tap into that, we can return home to the inner experience to tap further into. So what's my present viewpoint bodily knowing about my inner experience of what am I still holding about that? Mm -hmm. And that's where change happens. That's where, you know, we can begin to allow attention, allow a sensing the more to notice what have I not yet let go from the past? Yes. Because you'll inevitably have I not it. come closer to because you know I've allowed fear to, to sort of be a protector yeah. or yeah. anger to be a line of defense. And once I can connect with that emotional quality or the story, the content mm. about it, I can then come deeper into connection with my own inner experiences, my own body really felt sense, but it often comes from that shared connection that you have something about your inner experiences of this, mm -hmm. and I have mm -hmm. my own. And that's where it kind of is a point of departure where it might be a different way of coming inside. Yes. So basically what you're saying is doing it together provides a catalyst for, for um, getting more out of the process. Yes. Yeah. 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 Beautifully said. Yeah. Being together, doing it together becomes a catalyst. It sparks, it connects so that someone can come closer to their own inner experience. Yeah. And these, these are not focusing terms, but they're psychotherapy terms. Yeah. Um, at times, 
were assisting or were supporting the process of a focuser mm -hmm. with a term we call co-regulation. So we're mm -hmm. together in this space, the shared resonance space. And just my presence, my being with you as you're being with a felt sense of something mm -hmm. is helping you to sort of stay self in presence. Yes. Co-regulate to say, I can come closer to this aspect of this fear to be present with it. Whereas someone alone may be like trying to self-regulate and say, I can't go in that cave. I can't go closer to that. I can't look at that. And that's where that co-regulation, that support of the self in presence of another as a listener mm -hmm. with a focuser who's attempting to self-regulate, but gets to that, that edge where they're like, I'm not going any closer to this right now. Yeah, and that's where yeah. they might go back to their ways of being, their ways of doing, a coping strategy that they've yes. used already in the past. I was just going to say, because I could also imagine when you do this by yourself, it's much easier to not even get to that point because before you get there, you already carried away by all these triggers or like these past experiences that pull you away from actually being present. Um, yeah. And, and when we, when you were just um, sharing this, something came up that I think it's the same with, with, Honesty, I've, I've interviewed um, someone who's, who's closely involved with this radical honesty practice. And it's basically about expressing whatever it is that you feel in this moment, not to make anyone wrong or not actually to communicate anything, but just to get past something, to be able to let it go and move through it. And I think also, therefore, you need someone to hold the space and to actually hear you which is obviously a human need that we all have. We want to be seen, we want to be heard. And to do this together, I imagine it provides that. And, and it also makes sense to do this um, together. Would that be something you do one-on-one -on -one, or is that also a group thing? I've seen on, on, on um, your profile um, that you also offer this for in a group setting. How would that work? Yes, so it's just, it's um, teaching the practice, okay. focusing, felt sensing in a group. Um, mm -hmm. We do a two-year training, which gives people an opportunity to create a safe space, a supportive space. Um, each individual is learning the process of focusing, how to make contact with a felt sense, how to stay with it, how to get the more access, open, what Eugene Genlin terms these peoples of perception, how we can begin to perceive and sense the bodily felt sense and stay with it mm -hmm. in this non-judging presence, this curiosity that we bring toward it. Yeah. Um, and in a group, it's just this supportive, um, space where people are learning the process together and deepening their own practice mm -hmm. practicing um, to be a listener to a focuser to be a focuser and be listened to in that way and ask for what they need so that they can make contact to a felt sense and um, in that group space there's also now we're expanding the shared resonance, right? So mm -hmm. we have both a place where that shared connection may feel like, oh, that's very resonant, but there also may be this recognition of where dissonance happens, right? A, a, where, oh, that, that thing that someone just said or that, that, that bodily felt sense they're describing is actually, I'm noticing, I'm getting triggered or I'm mm -hmm. getting affected. Yeah. And it's a place where someone may actually move away from their own inner process. Mm -hmm. And yet there's this shared connection where by being with in a group, another person who's focusing, 
there is the process is occurring yeah. in that person who might not yet be ready to dive deeply in but can be present and observing but also sharing this felt healing mm -hmm. and it might be a trigger in some way or, or a stirring of something that is left untouched with them to to touch touch later on touch later yeah. on yeah. yes yes yeah. so it's like even if you touch a felt sense you make initial contact to it yeah. you know it's there it knows you know it's there yeah. and and you can choose to come back to it yeah. or the body will choose to hold it in this storage container that yes. i talked about before yeah. and you know we store things for years and years and years sometimes and oh, other absolutely. Times, sometimes generations perhaps generations yeah yeah would, would yeah. you say that this storing could we um classify that as tension or how would you describe this this storing within the body yeah, it's not one specific tension, but it's it's often the um, the more the the tension, the discomfort, right? So we have a saying. Um, it's a beautiful saying that Mary McGuire, a long-term focusing trainer, and Janet Klein were doing interactive focusing, and they turned that we want to get to this point where it's safely uncomfortable so that we can be with these bodily tensions, these bodily discomforts to deep in contact to it. But there's this point where we know, where we sense we're unsafe. Hmm. And that point at which we're unsafe, that's where our, you know, our, our lower brainstem, our amygdala, our fight flight freeze mm -hmm. response begins to kick in. And we can no longer access. Uh, we we move away from yes. bodily felt sensing, right? So um, there's we have awareness. We can keep something company. We can make some distance from it to come to it in the present moment. Notice the tension, but there is a point at which we get where, okay, it feels safe. So when we're listening to someone, we're checking, does it feel okay? Does it mm -hmm. feel safe to be with this right now? Yeah. Does it feel okay to come toward it a little closer? Or do you need some space from it? And so we, we learn over those two years in a group training, what are some of these techniques to be able to come toward safely uncomfortable so that someone can stay with a tension in the body, a pain, yeah, yeah. a discomfort um, that maybe otherwise for long periods of time, they've always moved away from, stepped away from, not gone toward. Yes. Um, and that's a way of allowing what has the body has kindly stored. Yeah. Perhaps intergenerationally, perhaps for yeah. someone else yeah. um, mm. or for myself so that I can begin to safely, uncomfortably be with these bodily felt senses so that they can shift and become a more comfortable, a more um, a loosening, a lightening. And these are felt shifts people will notice in their mm -hmm. body. They come toward attention and they just say hello to it, or they keep it company, or they bring their curiosity to it, you'll hear them say, oh, I notice it loosened, or, oh, there's a lightness feeling in my, in my body, like I was feeling heavy, and now there's this lightness feeling. Yeah. And, and so there's these felt shifts yes. that encourage, come back, return yeah. to the body. Yeah. And, that, that, and that's also, instill more curiosity, I imagine. Instills yeah. more curiosity, yeah. yeah. Two questions that come up. Um, you said at some point you arrive where, it's, where it feels unsafe to proceed or to continue further. Um, what, what is the practice or what is the, the way of dealing? Is that receding? 
and, and calming down again before, how would one deal with this? Yeah, so we call it resourcing. It's like um, helping a person to just stay there, you know, mm -hmm. not quickly move away from it, but maybe stay there noticing this sense of feeling unsafe and then checking maybe their self in presence, yeah. maybe um, using some grounding tools to help them re-presence. Because what may have happened is they're no longer self in presence, but they're in their memories of their past or they're in this thinking pattern that is so familiar and so automatic mm -hmm. that they might return to it. Yeah. Um, these are stuck places in essence, yeah. but we want someone to be with their stuckness, but not go into it, not go toward it, but just kind of hang out there, noticing and resourcing back into presence, back into grounding themselves in this present moment, but kind of holding the line or yeah. staying, you know, at some safe distance to say, okay, you noticed that's unsafe to go toward. Yeah. Let's yeah. let's stay here. Let's maybe back up a step. Let's let's come back. We might notice the contact of our body on the chair we're sitting mm -hmm. on. We may invite someone to actually stand up and kind of reground themselves. Notice their feet on the floor. Mm -hmm. Notice the support beneath them. We may ask them to open their eyes if they have their eyes closed to kind of look where they are right now. Become present again. Moment. Re-presenting them yeah. to kind of resource that moment. Um, and, and that helps them to notice, oh, what's unsafe is actually the pattern of thinking mm. or the memory of how scary it was when I was being beaten uh, or, you know, whatever it was, or when mm. I, I was, you know, I had a sudden, you know, I remember my father died of a heart attack on the floor and I was the first one to find him, you know, mm. so it's, they, they get so close to all the emotion that's been stored of the memory and we don't want them to go in it and get flooded. Mm -hmm. We want them to stay there, re-presence, be curious about about like what about that is still with you right now mm -hmm. today with a resource of presence with a resource of curiosity so we have to reopen their curiosity and that's and why that you do this door is shut yes that i was going to say that's why you do this standing or feeling the chair and looking around because it brings one back into here and now instead of away in those emotions that's right, because they are physically in the environment and the environment is in them, Yeah. right? They may be in their home or in their office or in a in place of nature where, you know, they already can access the resource of support that's in the environment they're in, in the present moment, mm -hmm. right? So it's that connecting to the environment that's around us, maybe a person, right? Somebody who's being listened to or guided by a, a guided focusing process. Um, so certified focusing trainers, focusing oriented therapists guide someone um, to, to just re-resource, re-present, stay in that. Mm -hmm. And these tools help that person to stay there um, to kind of really regain access to, oh, I am safe here. Yeah. yeah. And from there, ultimately be able to enter into this area and, uh, and, and even, even further down, be able to let go of whatever was there. Yes. Yeah. You said another interesting thing, um, which I, I which got me curious. You said that sometimes we store something for someone else. Yeah. How does that work? Could you could you have could you share some examples that bring this to light? Because it's very interesting. Sure. Yeah. So you talked about intergenerational. Um, yeah. So yeah. we have 
intergenerational. So uh, the greatest example I could use right now, what's currently <clears throat> happening from the pandemic is a young child who's totally present, totally curious and totally in full trust of their parent. Mm -hmm. But this parent is incredibly anxious and um, concerned about the mm -hmm. virus. Um, that yeah. parent is, is resonating anxiety, yeah. resonating nerves. And that child over time, over sometimes years, is being impacted by that resonance of uh, their trusted elder uh -huh. and maybe multiple trusted elders and that body is storing oh this felt sense of you know whatever i'm describing mm -hmm. of them out there of you know the term we use is anxiety or nervousness or it's that quality in here and they so internalize every time it. i feel that I'm storing something's unsafe here. Put a mask on. Yeah. Something's yeah. unsafe here. Go home. Yeah. Something's unsafe here. Um, you know, don't talk to strangers. And yeah. so we internalize that as a child and we store it in the body yeah. because it's coming from a trusted elder. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very good example. Yeah. And I think we do that in many more contexts, indeed, of people that we that we trust and that, that are close to us. We're very susceptible for those things, I imagine, especially in, in a setting where we have our guard down. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And so that's where some of those what you described as. So I I have a one of my courses that I teach is called Curiosity's Tether. Right. Mm -hmm. You think of a tether that holds a boat. Um, tied to the moors it tied to the side of the the river or the ocean so it can't get away right but mm -hmm. when you're ready to sail on smooth waters mm -hmm. you untether the boat and you curiously go out on an adventure yeah. right so there's these tensions that we hold in the body and so sometimes in focusing we curiously even just notice right the tethers we're being held by Mm. Right. So that that tether of this trusting adult that has taught me that this bodily felt sense of butterflies in my stomach or this squirming like worms mm. moving through yeah. dirt in my stomach is um, something to to really recognize and and maybe take uh, a Tums or, you know, so we also learn patterns of being we learn tools to cope with it yeah but we tether and we hold both to say okay is there another possibility is there another way to be with what you're noticing inside there and and so we help gently come toward that we don't tell them don't trust your parent but we you know we tether we let them stay tethered to that while we also, you know, begin to hold and help them hold. So what are you noticing happening inside there as you're noticing outside or, you know, where you return home or you return, you know, you, you don't want to go to school, you know, because you feel nervous or mm -hmm. because you, you're at school and you begin to feel that. You know, what else? And we teach those grounding, those presence, right? That, you know, can you, can you notice your chair beneath you? Can you take a walk in the hallways? And we teach children, you know, in grief and loss, often that's happening, right? If we lose one parent, mm -hmm. that parent is grieving at the same time that they're trying to take care of children. Yeah. And so the grief process has lots of turbulence to it. Yeah. And that parent in the best way that they know how is tethering their child maybe to other adults, like a therapist, like a, a grandparent, like a teacher <laughs> who's stable, who's supportive, who, who can be with those tensions 
those discomforts yeah. so that that child can grieve it, it sometimes differently than the parent can grieve. Yeah. Yeah. So a parent may have 50 years of memories, whereas the child has 10. Yeah. Or the parent has 38 years of memories and the child has five. Yeah. And so this, you know, bring yeah, and they're not overloaded with one way of, of dealing with it, but they can find their own way. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So we think about, you know, we're tethered, but we're also held supportively, safely. Yeah. By other people, by other supports. You know, often children who have been in traumatic experiences, um, they 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 naturally somehow there's so many of them that just naturally teach themselves like the earth is safe, Mother Earth. Mm. You know, going for a walk in the woods, going to sit by the river, they naturally know that's a safe place to be alone. Yeah. And it doesn't feel so safe at home or at school. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's like this natural organic connection we have to the earth. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting how our environment can really determine also the ability to go through this process. Yeah. I, I would love to dive into um, the six steps or the basic steps where people start when they familiarize themselves with this process. And... Eugene um, Gendlin, in his book, Focusing, he, he basically um, sets out six subjects or movements that are kind of the steps in this process. And obviously, this is the start. It's the basic start. And after that, I imagine when you really learn this practice, it kind of evolves into one, um, one kind of process, perhaps. And he, he identifies clearing the space felt sense, handle, resonating, asking, and receiving. Could we together go through these six steps just for, so for people to understand what are these basic different elements and how that process would evolve? Yeah, I'm just gonna get the sun out of my eyes. Sure, first. of course. It's hard to see now. The beautiful sunlight is very bright today, but it's in my face. Yeah. Let's see if that's better. Now it's too dark, just not in my face. Okay, sorry about that. No worries. Um, so we start with yeah. clearing the space and, and maybe this follows on, on what we talked about, how the nature, for instance, can be an important element of, of our able, ability to, to do something like this. Yeah, so I wanna say first that, you know, that the, there were not videos back in the time where Eugene Jen laid out these steps. And mm -hmm. so he, he describes, if you read more into his book, and if you read anything about focusing, that these steps are part of a dynamic process. Yeah. They're yeah. not a static, start with one, then go to two, like a prescription. Mm -hmm. um, you know, take amoxicillin for 10 days and your strep throat will go away. Yeah. You have to take the full 10 days. It's not that simplified. So we think of these steps that they move. And so when we get present mm -hmm. or when we sit down to begin a focusing process, we even ask ourselves, where do I wanna begin right now in the present moment? Mm -hmm. And so if my brain is really active, or my, there's a lot of content, there's a lot of story, or I've interacted with so, so many people, so many things in one day, clearing a space is a wonderful way to kind of connect with something that occurred that was maybe disturbing. And then I find a way to kind of come into my present self and I sense what is the space that I need from this whole thing about needing to get to work in 20 minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I'm just, okay, I'm going to just, I'm going to take that and I'm going to sense in my body and I'm going to, I'm going to put that over here for right now. And so we, we use the body and the space around us mm -hmm. to kind of make some space for 
content or um, this, okay, I'm thinking, I'm believing um, this, uh, this, um, that, that that person was feeling something about me in that moment when we had this exchange and, mm -hmm. and, and I, I got uncomfortable there. I remember that moment where I got uncomfortable and, and I didn't know what to do. Right. And so, so just for right now, I'm going to take that whole memory. And so inside me, I have the whole memory. I'm not going to tell you the whole story, mm -hmm. but the memory with this content is kind of expanding itself because my whole being knows it mm -hmm. and I don't need to share the content, but I can. Mm -hmm. And then I could say, okay, I'm going to check inside my body. I'm going to come present. And then I'm going to make some space between me and that. And I'm going to, I'm going to just, I'm going to lay that one right over here. And so we use our resonance, our felt resonance of our connecting with our felt sense, but clearing space and making some space inside. And that gives us an opportunity to then make contact with what we're gonna work with in that focusing time. So if I mm -hmm. had 20 minutes today, I may then with however many things I kind of made some space from, mm -hmm. I could come inside and I could then make contact with, okay, so which one of these do I want to be present with right now to kind of begin to get the more, the bodily knowing. And, and so when we hear things like, I don't yet know mm -hmm. how I feel about this, right? We want to come to that, what we call edge of awareness. Mm -hmm. The, the place where I don't yet know. Okay, so the knowing is when we get in thinking belief patterns, right? Our brain stores kind of concepts, mm -hmm. a thought about something, a pattern, a way of coping with something. And we can come to it in a present moment by connecting with the felt sense. So, so we might clear space first. Yeah. With that, I, I, I wanted to ask just to, to make sure I understand what you're what you're sharing is basically when 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 we do this this clearing of the space is identifying whatever is going on in this turbulent self and whatever it is that we're feeling, and we're kind of putting it somewhere so that we by that create kind of a physical space to become curious, okay, what's laying underneath it? And by just parking it without judgment and then going deeper, is that correct? Yes, yes. So we may be clearing it to get underneath it. Mm -hmm. We may be clearing it because the actual connection to it mm -hmm. has a resonance that I can use that felt resonance as that doorway in. Okay. Right. So sometimes having that that content, that 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 exercise of clearing space and making space for it, I'm connecting with the resonance of it yeah. in what is it what does it have to do with the more, but first connecting with it. Mm -hmm. But, but making some space to say, okay, it's not just that instance. And that's where we might look into intergenerational tethers. We might look into the, um, the disruption in a relationship mm -hmm. that we're now returning to try to repair. But we have a shared resonance but we could stick with, oh, well, she said that and she always says that and she always mm -hmm. does that. And, you know, that's why she's not a good friend. Mm -hmm. That would be our pattern thinking, our yeah. feelings that we stir ourselves and we flood. But if we start with clearing it with some content about it, it actually can help us connect to the shared resonance of what, what, 
was the disruption or the trigger or the discomfort that that present moment brought. Hmm. But that present moment is now already in the past. And I want to come present again to sense the felt sense of it in this moment to open the more. And then where does the handle come in? That... Okay, so then I'm making contact to, um, I have a, a handle, the symbol or the handle mm -hmm. might be that, oh, I haven't focused on this situation, but I notice every time I clear it and I make some space for it, mm -hmm. I, I notice like this, um, it's like right under my left ribs and there's a little bit of like a soft tissue that feels a little harder than it normally would be. Hmm. And, and, but I don't go toward it. I keep clearing it and then I come present to it and I notice it and then I go focus on something else, right? So, but I have a handle. I have a handle of this soft tissue like feeling under mm -hmm. the left ribs and it's a handle it's waiting for me it's stored there mm -hmm. and it's waiting for me to take a look at what is it about the resonance of this experience with this friend in that moment in that memory but when i come toward it i notice this bodily felt sense that i haven't yet come to explore mm -hmm. so the handle becomes that bodily felt sense that hasn't shifted yet. It stays there in yeah. the attention, a discomfort, or a way I could describe a knowing about it, mm -hmm. but I haven't come to the more of it. Yeah. I you haven't know come it's to there. my curiosity to it. Yeah. I know it's there. I sort of say, okay, there's my handle. I know it's there but I'm going to leave it for right now. So we, we make a handle and we say, maybe I'll come back to you and my focusing on, you know, on Sunday night or when I have another focusing session. And then- uh, Or maybe when I go out in nature and I feel safely comforted. We do do self-focusing. When we practiced a long time, a lot of people get into sort of crossing, focusing and meditation. Hmm. And so they self-focus but they use their meditation and then they self-focus, do some self-focusing. And sometimes it feels safer when you're very practiced. You could get that step that feels even too scary to do with a listener because yeah. we might feel judged by yeah. a listener. Yeah. And so it can go a step. So that's a handle. Yeah. It's like yeah. we know it in a bodily felt way, but it hasn't found its felt shifts, it's change, the more about it. And, and then can you share about the asking and receiving, which comes, I mean, it maybe not follows from it, but it's an element to it. Right, it could be, a, so if I were to come to this handle right now and I were to say, okay, I'm gonna get curious about this shaped like a liver, it has a color of white, right? So I'm coming toward this with curious, non-judging attention. Mm -hmm. It's, it feels like it's behind my ribs. It's stationary, mm -hmm. right? So I would just begin staying with it, making contact to it, asking it some questions. So the questions I'm asking, which, is part of the learning process, mm -hmm. are these what we call avenues to felt sensing. So I might ask my felt sense, okay, what are the qualities of it? Does it have a color, right? So I just asked all those questions very quickly because I'm very practiced and it reveals itself very quickly to me if it knows it has my attention because it yeah. trusts me, yeah. right? So, but I may slowly ask, does it have a color? Yeah, it's, it has this like fleshy and then there's edges of white to it. Mm -hmm. 
and it does it have a shape it's shaped like a, a the organ a liver the, the actual organ um i don't know what the liver feels like but the consistency of it when i pay attention mm -hmm. it's like uh fleshier and not as um not as meaty as what I think the liver is. I don't even know what the liver actually looks like or feels like the actual organ, but it feels softer or fleshier than what I think an actual liver feels like more meaty. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm staying with it. I'm deepening contact. I'm asking with non-judging curious attention these avenues, which help me deepen contact to that felt sense. And I stay with it and I deepen contact to it to allow it to reveal itself. If I get to a place where, you know, I may come up with a question, you know, something like using a felt sense word, like what makes it so fleshy? Mm -hmm. And I may stay curiously with that word because it's not coming so readily. And I may need to get quiet and pause and ask it that question so that I can receive the body's sense of it, mm -hmm. the body's knowing, the body's wisdom. But I have to get quiet enough to say, what makes it so fleshy? And if I pause, it doesn't come up with the answer right away, right now. It feels rushed. Yeah. And so I say, okay, you know, we don't have that kind of time because Beth has to get off to work and yeah. Julius yeah. has more. He might want to ask me. Um, but so we would pause, right? And so what, what a good way to describe it is even a nothing is something. It gives us that opportunity to, can I stay here? Mm -hmm. Can I stay quiet? Can I pause? Can I give that felt sense some space, some quiet time? Can I be there listening with every other part of my whole being attending to this focused felt sense, mm -hmm. right? It's like zooming in onto this felt sense of the liver as I'm asking this question. And I'm getting quiet and I'm pausing. And if nothing comes right away, we ask someone to wait longer because a blank space is a very thick space mm. of not yet knowing. That's a nice one. The blank space is a very thick, very thick space of not yet knowing. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. And so then. You yeah. can look up yeah. more about that on Eugene Jenlin's YouTube clip called Finding a Safe Place. It's about mm -hmm. six minutes. Yeah, I'll check that out. Yeah, thanks very much, Beth, for, for taking us through this process in real time. Yeah. And I'll just say we cannot miss the receiving step because it's yeah. often the one people skip past. Yeah. They want to get the information and then, okay, now I want to find action steps. Now I want to change something. Yeah. This receiving step is this very subtle in this present moment, this very important time to really connect with the bodily felt sense, the new felt shift, mm -hmm. and allow myself to receive what the body is showing me. Yeah. This is where we slow people down. I always say, I, I have never had to speed up a focuser, a new focuser, even an experienced focuser. Yeah. I often have to slow them down. Yeah. Invite them to pause. Invite them to receive the new, freshly felt sense because that's where change can occur. I was going to say, I, I, what I imagine ha happens or why this is so important is if we allow 
the time for it to be received into our conscious, um, then actually that shift can take place where we can let go of that part or where it's not buzzing around like a fly anymore. I'm just, uh, for lack of a better metaphor, but yeah, it makes sense. It needs to be heard. And, and the same when we are being heard, we can also let go of our tension or when, when, when we are angry and we can express to someone why we're angry and we're heard, we can let go of it. So I imagine it functions in a similar, similar way. Yes, very yeah. similar. It's like the felt sense needs to be heard, but also to be received freshly because it's very new. Yeah. And we may have years of believing it one way, yeah. that its message is different than that receiving its message as this, receiving the bodily, you know, the, the, the sensory experience in that present moment mm -hmm. of that felt shift and how it's freshly coming. And yeah. we may re need to return to that receiving for something to let go, for something to shift. So we may need to re return to it, receive more of it, resource the body. Revisit it, yeah, yeah. I, I because wonder... in essence, we're up against, you know, I believed it to be this way for a long time. I believed yes. it to... And so we're up against our own concepts, our own meaning making that our, our brain has, has stored for us, has held for us, has believed yeah. for us to help us, you know, stay safe in the world, to help us cope with life, oh, to help yeah. us make meaning yeah. of important, valuable things, yeah. but in a particular way. And when we come freshly to receive it, we're shifting that long-term, what we're up against, and it's like new and it's vulnerable and it's, you know, it's it's for the first time. It's a process of letting go. Yeah. I want to come back to the, the curiosity and, and letting go of judgment because I think these are very important parts and elements of this process to function correctly. What tips could you share um, about cultivating this curiosity in this process and letting go of judgments? Cultivating curiosity and letting go of judgments is, um, so one of the things is, accepting that we all make assumptions yeah we all make meaning yeah but we want to check our assumptions we want to check those meanings in the present moment so it's a natural process as well to make assumptions the step we miss is checking those assumptions, mm. checking those judgments with a non-judging focusing attitude, right? An attitude of curiosity. Yeah. So one of the questions we may ask a focus or we may guide them is, can you be curious about this in this moment or right now? because that person's checking their level of curiosity. Mm -hmm. like, and they may say an instant no, or yeah. they may say, oh, that's interesting. I have to slow down to check my assumption yeah. in the present moment. Yeah. Or, oh, maybe I can, I'm gonna try. But I know I get caught up in this assumption, this judgment, and I spin out of control. <laughs> I get, you know, and so people know a lot about their own judgments and mm -hmm. it's judgments of themselves. Sure, it's judgments sure. of others. It's judgments of these dissonant moments where they get triggered and that doesn't yeah. feel comfortable. It feels tense. It feels, they feel that, that, 
inkling of the felt sense, that discomfort in the body, the tension in the body. And so to be curious means to question our own judgments. Yeah. And so the maybe is a good place because that's where we can help them to ground in presence. We can help them to resource and we can help them to access a safe avenue into felt sensing in that moment. Yeah. Yeah, I think if we can cultivate more curiosity, not only with regard, obviously, to this process, and the same with being non-judgmental. I think not only our relationship with ourselves, but also with others, I think our life will dramatically improve um, if we can cultivate this more. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I want to thank you because just by doing this 39 ideas for life, ideas for life, there's like you're cultivating your own curiosity, yes. but you're also yes. sharing it out into the world and cultivating curiosity yeah. out into yeah. the world. And when there's like something in our inner curiosity that's peaked or that's um, interested mm -hmm. there's like we want to share that out into the world yeah and and you're doing that and and that is like maybe there'll be other people out into the world that their inner curiosity connects with your curiosity yeah. with these 39 ideas and and people will become more curious yeah yeah, it's 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 been a really interesting process and it has sparked a lot of interesting conversations and connections and new avenues. So it's been yeah, it's been amazing. Um, I want to be mindful and respectful of the time. Uh, one last question, and this is actually a question I always like to end, end with, which is what question? I mean, there, uh, we've only scraped the surface, I imagine, of, of the of the process of, of focusing. But what question about focusing didn't I ask, which I should have asked? So which angle did I completely overlook, which is an important one to mention or to touch upon? Mm. Well, if we had had more time, I would love to get further into the natural occurrence of process skipping and mm. stopped process. Um, because I think it's a really uh, depth filled and important um, aspect of the process mm -hmm. and to understand a little bit of it is to understand that both of them are very natural, organic parts of the process mm -hmm. that we process skip something because we're not yet ready to come to that felt Mm. bodily sensing of it and we stop our process or our process is stopped by things in the environment by mm -hmm. triggers that connect us to that felt sense and we can stop our process by pausing and sensing and so getting further into that is like you know it's so interesting and to and to really dive into understanding because stopped process is not a bad thing to stop the process, but mm -hmm. people sometimes relate to that word of stopped process as I'm doing something wrong. The process yeah. stops from doing something wrong. Yeah. Whereas yeah. we might say, if you're stuck, can you stay with the stuckness? Mm -hmm. That's stopping the process to ultimately find how to unstuck stick something. Yeah. But we may have to be with the stuckness for a, a number of focusing sessions yeah. to, to recognize what's stuck, to loosen it up. Yeah. before it can unstick, before an action step, a change can happen in our lives. Yeah. And so a stopped process is a very relevant part of the process. Yeah, I'm happy you add this because 
I, I imagine that there also comes in the self judgment of oh we're not we're not ready to do this or it's incomplete or we're you know and and actually being aware of the fact that this is actually a part of the process is a is a good addition I think in it's, the short time that we had to talk about it yeah 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 it's deeply intricate and it's um, really fertile ground to. Mm -hmm to help something, you know, sort of like uh, fertilizing your grass or your, your, your plants and, yeah. you know, planting a seed that then doesn't shoot through the ground for months. You know, it's like planting those seeds is this, this part of the process is really fertile ground for growth and healing to occur. Yeah, very interesting. I, I appreciate you sharing your experience and your knowledge in this regard. And I look very much forward to reviewing our, our recordings and to start the writing. I'll be doing that this weekend um, and, and putting it all together as best as I can. But I really appreciate you taking the time to take part. Well, thank you. Wonderful. I love to share and I thank you for reaching out. Yes. And I'm not even sure how we got connected, but I'm trusting the universe was yeah. um, connected us. And um, also I'm wondering if it would feel okay to you to share the recording. I would love to ask the Focusing Institute to put it on their website to Absolutely. have another resource for people. No problem, yeah. Uh, we have people all over the world kind of accessing focusing.org and yeah. Um, having these resources or um, if it feels okay to find a way to put it on YouTube, it might yeah. just spread in other ways that we don't even. I will, I will do that. I'll definitely, because I, I, I post the recording on my own YouTube channel. It will also be on the, on the website, on the blog. There will be an audio podcast with only the audio recording of, of this uh, talk and Great. share it any way you like. I'll follow up later when, when it's ready with all the links and everything. And uh, also I will put the, the links to, to uh, focusing.org, et cetera, so that people Great. can follow up and, uh, and find more. Yeah. Great. And um, one other thing that might be helpful to you, I don't know how much time you have to write this, but um, I did a, a lengthier two hour training, which is recorded on clearing space and making space and there's an actual demonstration with a focuser mm -hmm. that she's doing a clearing space and making space if you're interested in it i'd be happy to send that to you yes please yeah no i have the i have the weekend for it and if i'm correct i think that my deadline for the post is on coming monday so okay. um i will be doing the work this weekend and then maybe some finishing touches in the evening on monday yeah Okay, good. Thanks so much and have a great day. And I, I, you too. I'll stay in touch and I look forward to receiving the link. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thanks Take a lot. Care. Bye for Appreciate now. It. You're welcome. Bye.